So we talked about this a little bit already, but I did not see the theatrical version. I only saw the extended edition with my little boy, and right. we loved it. I thought it was Thank great. You. Yes, I thought it was. You're really such a cool test case. Yeah, that <laughs> it, and I was because everybody was talking. You know, some of my friends were like, oh, but I was like, what are you guys talking about? This was amazing. Like, Thank so I do. I really do want to put out that you know people should watch the extended edition. But it also got me thinking, like, what. What are some director cuts that you're aware of, that, like like movies that really benefited from getting you know some extra time and and, and seeing the director's version of things? Um, I have I haven't seen it, but I've heard the Kingdom of Heaven is mm -hmm. is extraordinary, uh, and Ridley Scott has done you know a lot of director's cuts. Uh, I've probably seen, as we were saying, like three different versions of, of Blade Runner over time, and uh, you know it, it's it, it's something that I uh, as a concept I know can feel indulgent, mm -hmm. uh, and it can feel like well you know like they just couldn't let anything go, and and this was a different scenario. This was we had a finished film, and uh, we were in a scenario where you know we were asked to to take out you know a good chunk of the movie, ultimately you know, 14 minutes of the movie. And so to have to, to go and try to figure out which of your darlings you can kill, which can go. Uh, so it, it really wasn't that I went back and did a director's cut. It's just that we we have been, you know, honestly, just like given the gift of right. being able to, to share the original film. This is the movie Untampered. Yeah, and it was it was mixed. Like it was that was it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I tampering, like I, I don't want to create like a sense of, of animosity here I honestly like you know if you choose to become a filmmaker if you choose to become a filmmaker uh, and uh, you you get into a scenario where people are spending you know hundreds of million dollars on your movie and uh, there are a lot of interest there and there are a yeah. lot of people uh, who you know who are making business decisions that that need to serve uh, many needs and so you've got to figure out how to navigate that and and it's kind of part of the job they don't teach you how to do it in film school yeah so there's been a lot of online chatter about uh, Jurassic World crossing over with Fast and the Furious I don't know if you're aware of this, but do you also want to see Dom Toretto get eaten by a Dilophosaurus? I mean, you know, of course not, because I am obviously like the most earnest maker of Jurassic Park movies <laughs> that we have. Yes, uh, I think that if if one came in looking to uh, look at them, uh, watch them ironically mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to earnestly, uh, that might be exactly where you'd go. Yeah, no, I prefer the earnest direction. But is there another franchise that you think Jurassic Park actually could cross over with, and it not be in a, like a like a silly sort of way? It's so like this. This idea is so new that that, that wasn't allowed when I was a kid. You yeah. didn't get to just like yeah. You did it at like you know when you were playing with the toys, you'd smash them together. And now it's like well, whatever your parent company happens to own, yeah, you can <laughs> you can. I guess it would be born right because right. that's a. That, you know, I yeah. feel like him running away from dinosaurs, he'd be effective, but like, I'd put raptors, we kind of, you know, we did yeah. something in that vein. Yeah, I was definitely thinking of like universal properties we could do, like The Purge would be. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, a lot of comic book movies, um, they have these like, they're spinning out of these subgenres now. So, you know, some of them are for kids and some of them are for adults. And then, you know, some are comedies, some are dramas. Do you think that Jurassic can sort of do the same sort of thing with that? I, I find, I don't want to say I find Jurassic limiting, but I, I find, you know, it was somewhat unfranchisable in a lot of ways. The very core idea, uh, set up a scenario where pretty much every movie that came after it would be a remake of sorts mm -hmm. uh, unless you really changed the equilibrium which we finally did right. but you know the first five movies if we want to go over the plots are there's dinosaurs on an island uh, there's dinosaurs on a different island there's a child who's endangered from dinosaurs on that island there are more dinosaurs on the first island there's a uh, there the dinosaurs are endangered uh, and then this one is like you know a complex tale of genetic power set, you know, set in a world in which dinosaurs exist. And I think that the act of of making that shift, of making that change, will benefit future storytellers because now they actually can you know they can do what a lot of franchises do, which tell a story about people in a world in which something happens. In mm -hmm. this case, a world in which dinosaurs coexist. With right. Humans. Yeah, I only bring it up because I really want the R-rated Dilophosaurus horror movie. Yes. That's that's what I want to see. I mean, I, you're probably not alone. Yeah, you're I think that would be alone. great. And you can scale it back, which is a great way to lead into the next question. Like, what do you see, even if you're not attached to it, where do you, where do you see the future going for the Jurassic Park franchise? You know what's interesting is that whoever it is uh, will still be someone who grew up on Jurassic Park. Because you, you know, we were, we were speaking about this, like... I am uh, I am 45, and if you are 35 to 40, 
Jurassic Park was your movie. Blew your uh, mind. That was it. Yeah. Uh, and I was a little older than that, so I think the next filmmaker will be that much more uh, holding it tightly in their hands, yeah. honestly, the way I am with like Star Wars or Raiders mm -hmm. or, or Back to the Future. Uh, and so my advice to them would be, you know, hold it in your hands, but not too tight. Yeah. Speaking of, can I talk to you about Star Wars for just a second? Sure. Okay. So now that Disney's having all this success with the series, right? Yeah. I mean, I the, I got to say the series is what's made me a Star Wars fan again. Like I love The Mandalorian. I've I, I've loved uh, Boba Fett. Everything that they've done so far has been great. So if an opportunity presented itself where they came to you, would you be interested in you know talking to them about Star Wars again? Oh, I don't I don't know. I, I, I not because of not because of Star Wars, but because I feel like I've spent eight or nine years yeah. uh, you know, making new versions of the things we loved when we were kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, in one place or another. And there's not just a lot of pressure on that, but uh, it's a it casts a shadow over everything else that you want to do. Because you're, you know, in the case of I made a small film uh, after Jurassic World and I was the director of Star Wars when yeah. I made it. And, and and I think that to be able to to step out of that a little bit and, and uh, you know, not have everything I do be in the context of, of you know, our belief systems Yeah, uh, is interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, last question. Can we talk about why Chris Pratt's the number one Chris? I'm here to, I'm, I'm just here to take up for Chris Pratt. I, I love that guy. I like all those guys. <laughs> My name's Chris, and I'm saying I'm that he's the best Chris. any of those guys. <laughs> no way. Those are all good dudes.